group, and I'm a, the treasurer of the Book Industry Study Group. We appreciate your making time to join us today, whether here at the Harvard Club or online via Zoom. We realize all of our schedules are tight, and we look forward to making this a very helpful day for you. To kick us off, I'd like to invite BISG's chair, Kathleen Reed, to join us for some welcoming remarks. Kathleen is Vice President and Medica Medical Education Commercial Leader for Global Medical Education at Elsevier. She joined the board in 2018 and was named chair at this meeting last year. She just finished the first year of her two-year term as chair. The pandemic makes this her first in-person appearance as the chair, and I invite you to give her a warm welcome to the stage. Thank you, Joe, for that warm introduction, and good morning, and welcome to BISG's 46th Annual Meeting of Members. We have an exciting, content-filled day planned for you, but that's not the only thing I'm excited about. Look around the room, on your left, on your right, at every table you can actually see your colleagues, your friends. And in some cases, those people you've come to know on BISG committee calls or through their perceptive questions on a BISG webinar. We actually get to see one another. I'm not starry-eyed about the meeting in person. I wore a mask on my way up here from Philly, and we're mindful of all the risks. BISG has done a great job of keeping our committee structure and our extensive programming in place over the past two-plus years all on virtual platforms that we launched in early 2017, back when Zoom was truly in beta. We know how to make re remote work work. But we're also a collective association. We get things done by working across the supply chain to figure out problems, come up with alternatives, and convince folks that there's a better way. Sometimes that's best done in person, and today is one of those days. I hope you could feel it when you first got here, and I'm sure you'll feel it throughout the day today. We've structured our meeting to let our panelists talk with one another. There isn't much PowerPoint in the panels. We make progress by talking with one another, and we're going to model that for you here. Each session also includes time to hear from you, to have you ask questions, and to, and to add to the conversation and we can be part of the things that are growing, that are going, we're going to learn today. That too is how we work in our committees and our working groups. Everyone has a voice and the loudest ones don't always carry the day. Respect, engagement, and mutual support for good ideas. That's the story you'll hear in many ways. Perhaps most directly when we recognize Joe Ganella and Pat Payton two of our, with two of our industry awards. While this approach isn't really new for us, it does seem more urgent now. We've survived, and in many cases prospered in the face of the worst health crisis in a century. But I don't think any of us feels settled. There's a general sense that we might be approaching or even at an inflection point in our industry. That's the through line for today's conversations. Where are we now? And where do we need to be? In the first panel, our committee chairs will frame what we're working on, but they have strong opinions about what we should be working on. When we hear from three leading industry associations about, oops, sorry, <laughs> about their efforts to improve how publishing manages diversity, equity, and inclusion, you'll have a sense of that we've been doing good work, but we have much more to do. The panel that closes out our morning, led by Firebrand's Joshua Talent and Open Road's Mary McAvaney, tries to answer the question, will this period of change ever end? You'll have to stick with us to find out. And as we close out the program, we'll hear a publisher and an industry partner share their takeaways from the day, the starting point for the year to come at BISG. 
where we'll keep working to solve problems that affect two or more parts of the industry. Now, BISG is not all work and no play. At lunch, we'll be presenting these three awards, and I'm particularly excited about, and when we we'll wrap up at 2.30, we'll continue the conversation at a reception on the third floor, here in the mahogany room. As if all the rooms weren't mahogany here. <laughs> um, before all of that, though, we're fortunate to welcome Michael Peach the, to deliver this meeting's opening keynote. Michael is Chief Executive Officer of Hachette Book Group, which comprises seven publishing groups, Grand Central Publishing, Hachette Nashville, Little Brown, Little Brown Books for Young Readers, Orbit, Perseus Books, and Workman Publishing. As you know, HBG is the U.S. division of Hachette Libre, the world's largest publisher, or third largest publisher of trade and educational books. As CEO, Michael has overseen the acquisitions of Hyperion, uh, acquisitions of work, Workman Publishing, Perseus Books, Black Dog, and Leventhal, Hyperion Books, through a period of growth and transformation at HBG. Earlier in his 40-year publishing career, as publisher at Little Brown and in editorial positions at Crown and Scribner, Peach published books by acclaimed writers, including Michael Connolly, Malcolm Gladwell, Peter Gorolnik, Stephanie Meyer, Walter Mosley, James Patterson, Keith Richards, J.K. Rowling, Stacy Schiff, David Sedaris, personal favorite of mine, um, Donna Tart, David Foster Wallace, and Malala. He continues to edit select books and has this passion for the close partnership between writers and publishers is the foundation of his approach as CEO. Michael serves on the boards of PEN America and Poets and Writers and is currently serving as chairman of the Association of American Publishers. He and his wife, Janet, a, a children's book editor, have three children and live north of New York City. We greatly appreciate Michael's interest and willingness to join us today. And I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Please join me in welcoming Michael to the stage. Thank you very much. All right, the binder transfer is complete. That was the, the most nervous making part of the day. <laughs> I want to say that you all look great. Wow, it's wonderful to see everyone in the room together after all these years. And I hope all the men in the room had as much fun as I did trying to find a jacket that would still close over your middle. <laughs> right, I'm going to try to do this with an iPad because my uh, printer in the office is no longer connect connected. My computer is no longer connected to the printer. Uh, so I'm trying a new technology here. Um, we're going back to the office next week uh, at Hachette, two days a week. Um, I just, I'm really excited about being able to see colleagues again, and this is a great preview. Um, I haven't seen so many neckties, I mean, literally, none of us has in two years. You look great. So thank you, Kathleen. Uh, thank you to everyone who's here today, uh, and thank you for the important work that you do on behalf of our industry. I want to thank the HBG colleagues who are long servers on the book industry study group. Uh, Phil Maddens, Dave Kramer, Raina Kornblue, Andy Ball, William Clark, you know all these names, Neil Hiramath, Rena Modi, Kendra Poster, Kate Travers, and Matt Hubin. And of course, I want to thank our mighty Chief Operating Officer, Joe Mangan. I am really happy to be invited to talk. Uh, I think of the Book Industry Study Group as having more technically oriented conversations that I often get to be included in. Uh, but I wrote a piece for Publishers Weekly at the end of last year about the future of book publishing, and uh, Brian O'Leary told me uh, he felt that operationalized a lot of the challenges our industry is facing, which I have to admit I found uh, wonderfully flattering. Uh, my background, as you heard, is about as far from operations as you can get in our industry, so the idea of operationalizing something made me feel really, really, really special. I want to say a little bit about who I am and how I came to be here. Um, how to be, I came to be where I am, so you know where what I have to say is coming from, very briefly. First, you're talking to a true book nerd. 
I grew up uh, in a military family, uh, one of seven kids. We moved every couple of years, and my mom told me uh, later on that every time we moved, we had to leave behind any books we'd accumulated because there was a weight limit on what you could carry uh, from, from us posting to posting. So, but, and that, that jived with my feeling of always being hungry for more books. Uh, so the, the books were both a, a retreat into privacy in a family of nine and a way to learn about ideas and worlds beyond what was in my immediate ken. And I was one of those kids who chewed his way through classroom libraries and then school libraries and, uh, and base libraries and then uh, local public libraries, and I expect, uh, I expect you were too. I went to college thinking I was going to become a lawyer or something professional with the promise of a decent uh, salary. And instead, I couldn't help myself. I just ended up taking English classes. That's all I wanted to do. It felt to me like the secrets of the universe were encoded inside the poems of William Butler Yeats, the novels of Charles Dickens, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and elsewhere if I could just find them. And I was fortunate from there to find employment <laughs> at all after that. Um, I got an internship at David R. Godin uh, in 1978. Uh, I'm sure, sure you know David. Uh, he just celebrated his 50, 50th anniversary as a publisher. Uh, and I went from there to, to work at Scribner's in, in 1979. It was still owned by the Scribner's and was there when it was uh, acquired by Macmillan. In 1985, I moved to the Harmony imprint of Crown Publishing and was there when that was acquired by Random House. And in 1991, I came to Little Brown, uh, which was part of the newly formed Time Warner Book Group, uh, formed when uh, Time and Warner merged. Uh, Time owned Little Brown and Warner owned Warner Books, so the Time Warner Book Group was born and that created an opportunity for me. And I was there when that was acquired by Hachette Book Groups in, in 2006, a pattern uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with in our industry. Uh, so my career has taken me from the intern to uh, general dog's body assistant, uh, editor, editor-in-chief, publisher, and I've been CEO since 2013. I'm not just a book nerd, but I am a publishing nerd. I love reading histories of our industry and biographies of publishers, uh, more secrets of the universe encoded in there. Um, my favorite nerd fact that I've gleaned from that reading I think is appropriate for this gathering. Do you know how New York City came to be where most trade publishing in, New York, in, in America is situated? In the 18th century, there were uh, you know, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia all had substantial publishing companies, all about equal size, and those cities were pretty comparable. In 1825, the opening of the Erie Canal made it possible for New York-based publishers to get their books to Chicago uh, for 90% less than it had cost them uh, before the canal was opened. So New York publishers uh, were able to reach more readers uh, more cheaply, be more profitable, and it became where, as an author, you wanted to be published if you wanted to make more money and, and uh, reach the whole market. So as always, it's all about uh, investing in infrastructure and supply chain uh, from the very beginning. As a publishing devotee, I've loved learning every single thing about our industry that affects how a manuscript uh, created by a writer gets turned into a book and gets bought by a reader and how we and the author and our partners make money in the process, as well as connecting with readers and contributing to culture. That, career, uh, that curiosity led me to a career as editor and publisher, where I got to work with, work with some amazing writers, which, which uh, Kathleen has kindly uh, gone through for us already. But uh, it's been pretty amazing getting to work with these brilliant, brilliant creators. Um, I don't think we mentioned, I mentioned it there, I got to work with Chuck Berry and Ronnie Spector and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Um, it's been just a joyful experience. Um, and now as CEO, I get to work not just with authors and the wonderful people across every part of Hachette who bring those authors' books into the world, but with the uh, many talented people who work for companies and organizations like Amazon, the ABA, Barnes & Noble, Audible, ReaderLink, Apple, Google, Firebrand, Ingram, Overdrive, LSC, NPD, AAP, Penn, National Coalition Against Censorship, Poets and Writers. It's an amazingly rich field of work in a range of interconnected companies that we're all fortunate to work within and among. And I have to say, this work is more constantly rewarding and stimulated than I ever imagined any line of work could possibly be. Another of the things that Brian said he appreciated about my take on the future was that it was optimistic, uh, which doesn't seem extraordinary to me to be an optimist, except in our business, it, it kind of is. I've spent my career, as I'm sure you have, reading stories about all the ways we're going to die. <laughs> Books are going to die. The print book is going to die. Bookstores are going to die. Publishers are going to die. No one edits anymore. The bean counters in are in charge. This steady diet of negative nonsense that surrounds our industry, and it drives me batty. I've always tried to understand uh, 
why there's so much negative commentary flourishing in a business that is, in fact, thriving for centuries. Um, and I've come to believe that, um, a, I'm sorry, a business that's grown, that's grown steadily for the past several decades, a business that's come through the digital transformation in great shape, especially when you compare it to adjacent industries like music and magazines and newspapers. I've come to believe that a reason that so much negativity, negativity flourishes uh, in part is because our industry's success is built on innumerable failures. As you know, we bring out tens of thousands of books every year. And most of those books, many or most of those books, lose money. And more importantly, they disappoint their creators' expectations. Those authors had all thought they were going to reach more readers than they thought, or many of them. Uh, not all, of course. Uh, every, of each, behind each of these disappointments is an author who uh, didn't achieve what they thought they were going to be able to achieve, an editor and a publicist and a marketer, a marketing team feeling that the book didn't reach its, inten its potential, a bookstore clerk glumly boxing up those books for returns, a warehouse worker feeding them into the shredder. All that disappointment creates a, creates a rich soil of failure in which negative stories take root and flourish. Uh, and in light of that, I think it's always important for all of us to focus on the objective facts of our industry's growth and the enormous successes that we do have. What I want to do today is to look at both sides of our industry's coin, the good and the bad, and see if we can single out some opportunities worth expanding on as we move forward, which I understand is the entire purpose of this day. We're all book people, uh, so let's go back to our high school reading lists and start as Dickens would have us start. It was the best of times. And for book publishers, that is absolutely true. Uh, without uh, diminishing or making light of the uh, enormous human losses the pandemic has brought, it is also the best thing that ever happened to our industry. Uh, many publishers, most publishers are reporting record revenues and profits for the past two years. Uh, we're seeing the highest you know, demand, I'm sorry, a pandemic that I believe we all thought at first would be devastating for our business, uh, in fact, has brought us uh, demand for books that's never been higher, with the highest percentage we've ever seen of backlist sales, our most profitable category. Ebooks and audiobook sales both rose. Online sales grew, again, very, very efficient. Children's book sales grew, reaching fut helping us reach future, future readers. We saw extraordinarily high sell-throughs, which is a dream come true for publishers, retailers, wholesalers, and great for the environment. Mass merchants that carried essential goods were able to stay open, even during the worst of lockdowns, including books among their essential goods. Online retail and digital platforms allowed readers to find and purchase books even when almost all bookstores were closed. And we all had lower overhead with our offices empty, T&E almost entirely gone, and marketing expenditures significantly reduced because we couldn't, just simply couldn't do a lot of the things that we did in the past. We've learned that we're more adaptable than we knew. We learned we can work remotely when necessary, that we can possibly reduce our physical footprints. And it forced us to make use of a lot of uh, communications technology that's been available to us for a long time, but we never took the opportunity to really explore fully and de deploy fully. Uh, that allows us to save a lot of money and be more efficient, especially around travel costs. And, e and even beyond the pandemic years, we're living in a great age for publishers, authors, and readers. Industry revenues have grown year after year for decades, excluding a recession and a disruption or two, but we are in an, in an industry that's just kept growing. Even if only growing 1% a year in the pre-pandemic years, it's growth, uh, and growth is good. Physical book sales have persisted and even grown, with customers purchasing them almost equally from community bookstores and online booksellers. And not that physical books are the best format for everyone, but we are fortunate to have an industry that supports multiple formats for everyone's, every customer's reading preference and, sh and shopping preference. And unlike other media businesses, our content actually inheres really powerfully in its physical delivery device, the printed book. Every backlist book in print can be found and in front of a reader's eyes within seconds or days thanks to digital formats and online retailers and the steady improvement of POD quality, which is an un unmeasurable benefit to authors, to readers, and to our world. Bookstores, both chain and independent, are doing well, finding new investors and reinventing themselves. A steady increase of digital and online sales over the years has increased our efficiency since they have low returns, bringing us environmental gains. Beyond bookstores, mass merchants of many kinds and ever more specialty stores make books an important part of their consumer offering. Internet connectivity allows us to reach ever more readers directly, either because they're fans of a particular writer or because we're able to connect with them about their areas of interest. 
Social media continues to evolve in new ways that allow excitement about books to spread uh, it, electrically, uh, bringing us things like Goodreads and BookBubs and more recently uh, book talk sales storms. Books continue to be essential contributors to our national conversations and to be the starting points of ever more movies, TV shows, and more. And the evolution of podcasts connects more and more readers to the pleasures of narrative and brings them to audiobooks. The generation of young readers who came of age over the past couple of decades on a diet of Harry Potter, Hunger Games, Twilight, and other mega series had books as a huge part of their imaginative upbringing. They lived through books, and that created a generation of, of, young re of adult readers now hungry for more books. Writers of color are being published in greater numbers and with stronger support than ever before. And we're even increasing the diversity of the publishing companies we're part of. I say that book publishing is an extraordinary success story, and I feel incredibly lucky to be working in these best of all times. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed as I've talked to older colleagues over the years that they're more likely to be the ones saying, the sky is falling. And I've always thought that was because of nostalgia for days uh, when the business had less complexity. But lately, lately I've been thinking maybe they're right. Maybe this time the sky actually is falling. Maybe, actually, it was the worst of times. As we've been navigating the past couple of years, I'm sure you've noticed a concatenation of crises that may even be worthy of the kind of pessimism the business has long engendered. We've all been fighting our way through what Keith Richards might have called a crossfire hurricane, dealing with each one of these crises as it crashes over us, never really having the time to take a breath and take in how many of them are swamping us at once. But when you line them all up and stare them in the face, holy Gutenberg, it truly feels like some of the biggest and most complex challenges our industry has ever had to confront. Just looking at some immediate crises, the pandemic itself may be relenting enough for us to gather in person here, but sh it's surely not over. With it, we've had to confront concerns about our employers, employees' well-being, physical well-being of a kind we've never had, with needs for new policies, ma ma vaccine mandates, mask policies, contact tracing, social distancing, working with unvaccinated employees. We all especially had to deal with how to keep our warehouses operating, work that ca cannot be done on a Zoom call. Uh, and that involves safety considerations we've never had to grapple with before. This particular peak of the pandemic may be receding, but I think it's safe to say we're all going to be dealing with its impacts uh, for years to come. Laser, labor costs are rising at a rate that has not been seen in recent history, especially at distribution centers with real challenges getting the staff we need to get our books shipped on time. We have manufacturing shortages and complexities that, such as we've never seen, driven by a combination of industry capacity, change, pandemic effects, and labor costs that could be years resolving. We've all had to grapple with real pain uh, throughout our companies having to rebuild manufacturing schedules, change on sale dates, rebook promotions, re rebuild publicity and marketing plans for new titles, and then find ourselves unable to buy, to restock the books that we've gotten attention for, sometimes for months. Compounding that, our shipping schedules and shipping costs are both expanding and increasing, especially with Far East manufacturing, but with plenty of domestic difficulties too. And then there is our remote work crisis. We have been able to carry on our business miraculously without our offices. But after two plus years of it, I think we all see and feel its shortcomings. Everything takes longer to get done. Zoom calls and emails are not always efficient and can't replicate a quick in-person conversation. Training and de development are extremely difficult. Company culture decays. We're working through an entropic downward spiral that is especially difficult for our newest employees who are having a hard time learning and connecting. Our business at its core is about generating and magnifying and spreading enthusiasm, excitement. And we've all felt how hard it is to truly stimulate or feel excitement across a screen. There are, there are sparks that fly in a person to person in a real time conversation that just die in the gap between screen and screen and email and email. I believe there's a reason we're all grappling with increased concerns about mental well-being. Working alone in our rooms, on our screens, we feel every pain of the business, every difficulty of the business amplified in isolation without the counterbalance of joy and support and context and perspective that we get uh, from working among our colleagues, colleagues we deeply know and trust. And with less in-person contact with colleagues, how do we inculcate a love of publishing in a new generation of employees? How do we manage a business that has more and more employees who almost never get to meet or see their managers and peers in person? How do we manage employee engagement, retention, and morale? 
Connected to that, we have the hybrid work challenge. For the first time in our careers, we have to ask ourselves, what is an office even for? Should we even have one? What do we do on office days to get the most, on in office days to get the most benefit from in-person connections? How do we make meetings work when half the people are together and half are dialed in? Of course, you're all keenly aware of the book bannings crisis that is uh, impacting our industry enormously at this moment in a pol polarized political climate where books and writers are demonized and librarians and school teachers are at risk for doing the important work of sharing ideas. We're working through a war in Ukraine, necessitating, necessitating for the first time in most of our careers that we make decisions on whether or how to interact with publishers, retailers, and even readers in Russia, plus expanding censorship in China, further affecting our ability to make use of their printing, in addition to the larger questions of working with publishers for whom censorship is a government-imposed fact of life. Copyright challenges are gigantic and cannot be overstated. Tech back companies uh, are coming for our content in every way they can. They're backed with vast invest investments uh, from companies whose business model is based on having every piece of content free or as cheap as possible that they can make available and sell ads against. And they're going to do everything in their power to erode copyright and expand fair use. An aspect of this is state legislations who are lining up alongside libraries in opposition to publishers to regulate the market for library digital books. We've had an extremely strong ruling in the AAP's lawsuit against Maryland, which we are all happy to see, uh, but we can expect new versions to keep coming at us. These laws pass unanimously in their state legislatures. There's enormous, easy support to be gained. Well, who doesn't support a public library uh, against the, the, the depredations of evil publishers? And we have a lot of work to do to tell our story and change that narrative. We have denial of service attacks and ransomware that are coming for our, our companies across our industry. Uh, we have, co we have uh, companies we work with who have lost tens of millions of dollars uh, fending them off and dealing with them, and they're challenging all of our security systems. And some longer-term crises and challenges, retailers that compete with us as publishers and privilege their own content above ours, uh, the challenge of discoverability, uh, as we continue to see a shift to online sales with more, of half, more than half of all book purchases now made on a phone or a tablet or a PC rather than in any kind of store, discoverability of a wide variety of new books, especially books by less known or unknown writers, becomes harder every day. There's a growing ability of authors to connect and monetize directly that connection with readers. The new generation of author direct reader offer, offering is via interfaces like Substack and Kickstarter, I'm sure have the attention of everyone in this room, and I'm sure all publishers are thinking hard about how each of our companies can make our relationships with the authors we publish even more essential and compelling. And the lack of diversity in our, publishing, in our offices and publishing programs is a continued and serious crisis as we manage a business with serious issues of racism and privilege and missing out on important potential audiences across our country. And last, environmental damage. We have an industry whose product is printed on trees that have to be cut down and pulped and shipped across the country using fossil fuels, and then when they don't sell, shipped back across, across the country uh, to be shredded. I'm not saying that each of these crises is of the same scale or impact, they're not, but wow. To all of you who've been managing through all of these and more over the past many years, I want to extend my admiration and sympathy and wish you courage as we go forward. Finally, <clears throat> I don't think it was Dickens who said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. It's attributed to Churchill, not definitively. I attribute it to Joe Mangan, who loves to use it. Uh, whoever said it uh, on that principle, with all the crises bombarding us, this should be the period of the greatest opportunities our business has ever had. The question I want to pose today is, what out of all these worst of all times crises and looking at the best of all times recent experiences can we turn into a benefit for the future for ourselves for the readers we sell to and for the writers we serve. I think we all accept at some level that the increased sales and positive business factors uh, that the pandemic brought aren't here to stay. And as people become able to do so many, do many things that they've been unable to do for years, um, they might not continue buying books in such unprecedented numbers. So as the elevated revenues and profits may recede, um, and a lot of these crises are still going to be here for a long time, the question I want to close with is, what have we learned that we can hold on to and build on for a better future? And how can BISG help? I know that some of the suggestions I'm about to make are not excuse me, in BISG's current scope, strictly, but perhaps there are ideas worth 
areas worth thinking about expanding into. The first is uh, sell-through. I don't think there is a single larger factor in publishers' improved profitability during the pandemic than the sell-through uh, improvement that, uh, that, that we have seen. We know some of the reasons uh, that it has uh, improved so much. An increase in online sales, uh, Barnes & Noble's new approach to ordering, stocking, and returns, and an increase in backlist sales, which tend to have higher sell-throughs. As the waters recede, how can publishers work with retailers and wholesalers to keep the gross inefficiency that bedevils our business from creeping back up and tearing those profits back down? What data can publishers exchange with retailers and wholesalers that we're not exchanging now that will let us keep stock in our warehouses and get it to retailers just ahead of their demand? The more we can hold on to or continue improving on these improved sell-throughs with retailers of all kinds and sizes, the more profitable both we and our partners will be and the less we'll waste environmental resources. The second is POD and local printing. Supply chain challenges have caused us all, I believe, to make more use of print-on-demand capabilities and local printing options. What are the steps we can take to make it no longer necessary to ship our books across oceans and even, or even across our country? Can this be a major step in reducing our carbon footprint as an industry? We know and we're happy that printed books are here to stay and we love our multi-format industry, but how can we make it a less wasteful part of our business? Third is diversity. I mentioned this twice, both as an area where we're making progress and as a crisis we're still not near the end of. Every publisher that I talked to has been working hard on making themselves more diverse, more inclusive, and doing a better job of recruiting, developing, promoting, and sustaining the careers of people of color. But the crisis persists, especially at the most senior levels of our industry. I wonder what the BISG can do to help us understand what more we need to do to overcome the issues that have kept us where we are for far too long. Is there a statistically valid, reliable, consistent way of measuring the industry's diversity that the BISG, BISG uniquely can pioneer so we at least have a baseline that can help us learn and provide us with an objective way of tracking our progress? Consumer behaviors. Uh, publishers spend their vast amounts of money on marketing every year, and we invest with stunningly little data to guide our investments or to prove that our investments are actually resulted in book purchases. Much of it is acts of faith that we're, actually, that we're identifying, reaching, motivating, and converting readers to buy our author's books. What can BISG do to help us better understand book buyers' behavior? And last, the topic that's closest to my heart, author partnership. Every person in this room is here because of the work of writers, creating books that they bring to us for publishing. Authors are our most important essential constituents and business partners and how little we understand them. In a world where self-publishing options are growing steadily and writers have ever more potent abilities to publish themselves and monetize their content themselves, it seems imperative that publishers know everything they can about what writers most want from them. What are the hopes that they bring as they approach us? What do they understand? What don't they know and what would be most useful for them to know? What do they love about our experience? What do they hate? What besides our advances and royalties makes them want to return again to a publisher that they've worked with? How do we make sure that these creators who are industry's lifeblood continue to turn to us for the next 500 years as they have for the last 500? <clears throat> I want to close by saying from one publishing nerd to another, thank you for your contributions to our wonderful industry. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Thank you. This is awkward. Sorry. Brian uh, uh, asked me to ask if there were any questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Sorry. It will be even more awkward if there are no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, right here. Right here. Thank you. So my question is, some of the uh, paper products that we use are now going to bamboo because uh, that's a more, I guess, environmentally sound way. Is that an option for printing books? That is a question that I'm really happy to hear and cannot give you the beginning of an answer to. Uh, <laughs> but I would love to, to learn more about it. And there are people at our table who can tell us uh, later. Yes. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Moral Sitar. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, in your presentation, you said industry revenue for 2020 was 16.7 billion. Do you have projections for 2021 or what they were in 2021? I'm just curious what the growth was. <clears throat> the, uh, the AAP's uh, statistics for 2021 are not yet uh, out. We have, uh, we have um, of course, NPD's projections and the pro pro projections, I'm just, MP NPD's data and uh, the monthlies from uh, the AAP, but we don't have a full industry data yet. But I think we're going to see across the industry it was it was even greater grace, growth than 2020. Sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, as a CEO, you mentioned diversity. I'm curious uh, within your or your own organization, what measures, what what actions are you taking to <laughs> to change the narrative uh, and to, to increase diversity, equity, and in inclusivity? Thank you for that question. I'm really, really happy to hear it and, and happy, happy to answer it. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject of great urgency uh, for me personally, um, um, just based on my, on my background, um, which I won't go into, but um, I, I've always cared enormously about expanding the diversity of our industry, and we've been taking, I thought we were working hard on it for many years. I made it a priority from the time I became CEO, and, and growth came very, very slowly. Um, and uh, what's, we, we've, um, I'd say the thing that uh, has made the biggest change is really enforcing the Rooney Rule. Everyone knows the Rooney Rule, which is you cannot offer a position to anyone until you've, for, uh, for any open position until you've considered at least, had at least two viable candidates of color in the pool of people you're, you're talking to. And we had that rule in place for a long time, but what I learned was that it was not really being enforced and uh, that the urgency of filling an open position, the pain of having a position open, open often overwhelmed people and caused, uh, caused it not to be um, uh, honored. And um, uh, focusing on that has led to great results. Um, we've also expanded the conversation within our company uh, enormously. Uh, I've engaged our entire senior management group uh, in, in, uh, in activities to not just do the work in our, that we do in our chairs, uh, but to get out of their chairs and leave the building, back when we had a building to leave, um, and go out into the world and meet with groups uh, that they don't usually re meet with to expand the pool of knowledge of people they might approach when an, uh, an opening comes. Another thing we've done is we have be, we've begun tracking uh, and making public to our employees and, uh, and to the public uh, our statistics. Uh, what, uh, how much of our, uh, what is the diversity percentage of our company, how has it changed over time, and the diversity of our, uh, of our publishing programs. And each publisher has set a target for themselves on, uh, on increase over time that they've uh, worked with their team on. There's enormous, uh, there's enormous engagement on the publishing side uh, to publish uh, more books by writers of color, and we've, beyond that, uh, been investing a lot in understanding how to market those books effectively to make sure we have teams and contacts that allow us to, to uh, get, help, help us reach the readers that we want to reach. We've formed a number of uh, employee resource groups uh, for, uh, em where employees can, uh, can um, gather together and talk about concerns uh, which they can bring forward to management. We hired a chief diversity officer who communicates uh, very regularly with the company uh, about uh, everything that we're doing. Um, and our, our board meets uh, about, we have a board meeting for all matters once a month and we have another meeting uh, just about diversity matters every other month for the entire board. So we're engaged across the entire uh, company with a large number of initiatives that we're, we're uh, tracking constantly and reporting on and uh, so the engagement at, at all levels has, has been important um, and uh, I've been heartened by the, uh, by the progress we've made. But as I said, we still have a long way to go to reach the le level of diversity that, that reflects the country that we're part of. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.